Hello. I'm Sophie Volpe, Chair of the Center for Chinese Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our annual LIM lecture. Our speaker today is Anna Shields, Professor of Chinese Literature at Princeton University, where she also chairs the Department of East Asian Studies. Professor Shields specializes in classical Chinese literature of the Tang, Five Dynasties, and Northern Song eras. Her interests include literary history and the emergence of new literary genres and styles, the sociology of literature, and the role of emotion in classical literature. Her first book, Crafting a Collection, The Cultural Context and Poetic Practice of the Collection from Among the Flowers, Hua Jianji, examined the emergence of the song lyric in a pathbreaking anthology. Her recent book, One Who Knows Me, Friendship and Literary Culture in Mid-Tang China, explores the literary performance of friendship in 9th century China through a wide range of genres, including letters, preferences, prefaces, exchange poetry, and funerary texts. Professor Shields served as president of the Tang Society Society from 2011 to 2018. She's a former editor of the East Asian section of the Journal of the American Oriental Society and is also an ed editorial board member of the Library of Chinese Humanities, Chinese English Translation Series. She is currently working on a new book that traces the shaping of the Tang Dynasty literary legacy during the Five Dynasties and Northern Song. Our discussant today is Robert Ashmore, Chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Welcome, Anna and Robert. Thank you so much, Sophie. So let me first uh, begin by thanking everyone for being here. Um, thanks to the Lim family for their generous uh, inauguration of this lecture series. I'm very happy to be one of the invited speakers. Um, Thanks to my colleague and longtime friend, Sophie Volpe, for the invitation, and to Robert Ashmore, chair, uh, for serving as discussant. And a special warm welcome to all of the students in the room. I'm very excited to see so much interest in classical literature, and I hope we'll be able to um, continue our conversation after my talk. So my talk today is a, is a kind of broad overview of my current book project, which is called Shaping the Tang Literary Legacy, Transformations of Tang Dynasty Literature in the Five Dynasties in Northern Song. So I'm investigating the transformations and the transmission of knowledge of Tang Dynasty literature over the two centuries after the dynasty's collapse in 907, roughly to the end of the Northern Song and spilling over into the early Northern, uh, Southern Song. So to some extent, this is a project of reception history, of jie shou shi, a field of scholarship that has become increasingly important in East Asian studies as we ask new questions of received versions of all kinds of knowledge, including literary canons. As I'm going to show today, the transmission and transformation of Tang literature in this watershed moment of the 10th through the 12th centuries is a fascinating story to explore because it sheds light in two directions. So on the one hand, we see more clearly both the randomness and the patterns of preservation that give us something that survives as Tang literature. But on the other, if we critically examine the new works that these later scholars created, we begin to see them as active transformers of the literary tradition, not merely passive receivers, and highly activist figures who are shaping the textual record to answer their own urgent questions. So I'm going to begin with some preliminaries, walk you through the relevant historical context, say a bit about the genres that I am investigating in the book, and then we're going to look at three case studies for the Tang writers uh, Han Yu, Li Bai, and Wen Tin Yun in three different texts from the Northern and Southern Song. And I'll conclude with some brief remarks on the impact of the transmission of Tang literature on evolving definitions of literary writing itself, Wen Zhang. Okay, so the riches of Tang literature that we have today are a res result of the accidents of history and significantly of the labors of 10th and 11th century scholars. In a symbiotic, mutually constitutive relationship unlike others in Chinese history, Song Literati looked to the Tang for political guidance, cultural inspiration, and literary education. And their efforts to preserve and reconstruct the Tang past resulted in countless new works. And nowhere were their efforts more important than in the shaping of the record of belletristic writing, Wen Zhang. 
Confronted with the scattered profusion of tens of thousands of texts that survived the Tang collapse, Five Dynasties and Song scholars sought to shore up knowledge of Tang culture in a period of rapid social, economic, and material culture change that constantly kept them aware of the possibility of loss. Now, the new technology of printing expanded the impact of their efforts exponentially. Both state-sponsored and commercial printing fed Northern Song literati interest in collecting and it proliferated texts across the empire. Hundreds of new works about the Tang survived the Jurchen invasion in 1127 and went on to circulate in successive late imperial dynasties. Now, the documented breadth and variety of these new productions of Tang literature are staggering. From massive collections like the early Northern Song anthology, Wen Yun Yinghua, the glorious blossoms from the literary garden that contain more than 10,000 texts, to smaller scale works such as collections of rubbings of Tang skili inscriptions, Five Dynasties and Song readers of Tang literature became interpreters, collectors of texts in all of their material manifestations, whether as fragile manuscripts on paper, fading stone and wood inscriptions, or as newly printed books. Their interest in the Tang extended beyond texts, of course, to the lives of Tang people, particularly the most celebrated Tang officials and writers about whom they compiled stories and wrote biographies. And they came to idolize a kind of small number of authors over the course of the Northern Song, particularly Du Fu, Li Bai, Han Yu, and Liu Zongyan. Now, of course, the material and intellectual task of reorganizing knowledge in the wake of dynastic change had been a venerated state practice since at least the Han Dynasty before. And it served as a consistent legitima uh, the legitimating practice of successive Chinese regimes. But thanks also to Song literati interest in depicting their own labor, we have a remarkably detailed view of their activity on this score in prefaces and colophons, letters, and BG notebook entries. Their reflections reveal the rising prestige and the utility of scholarly and connoisseurial work on Tang literature in the Song cultural landscape. Song scholars admired Tang literature profoundly, but they were not slavish or uncritical followers. Rather, they boasted about their uh, extensive knowledge and their acquisition of texts, and they labored to supplement and correct and reorganize their discoveries. And finally, from the perspective of material culture, decades of increasingly widespread practices of working with texts, handling papers and documents among Sung literati, laid the groundwork for renegotiating their relationship to the cultural past, something to be handled, and it gave them a profound sense of ownership of the tongue. Their versions of Tang literary writing capture multiple reconceptualizations of the tradition. Where some works, such as the biographies in the New Tang history, became authoritative and, or and orthodox accounts, other compilations claimed more modest ambitions, merely seeking to capture Tang literary excellence in various forms. But they are bound together by an intense desire to cement Tang literary greatness for contemporary and future readers and their success can be measured by centuries of ongoing influence. All right, since I know that many of you are not specialists in middle period history, we, I want to orient you very quickly in time and space. So we have maps here of the Tang, uh, Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, and the Northern Song. Just a couple of things to notice here. I have the, the capitals of the um, some of the major uh, kingdoms of the 10th century circled. A couple of things to notice here, just to think about. First of all, imagine the, the chaos and the magnitude of the textual diaspora um, in Chang'an after the Huangchao Rebellion and then after the collapse of the dynasty, texts being scattered along with people across the former Tang Empire. And then at, the, at, at Song reunification in the late decades of the 10th century, these texts are slowly recollected from the major libraries in the southern states and, and uh, in the capital at Kaifeng. So that's an image we need to think about, chaos and magnitude of, of the textual diaspora. But on the other hand, after the founding of the Northern Song, we have a 150 year period roughly of stability, minus the occasion of a, of a significant library fire um, in 1015. But this stability of the Northern Song alongside the growth of state sponsored and commercial printing meant that the Tang literary legacy had the greatest chance for survival 
than I think we have ever seen before in any dynastic transition. All right, let me give you a quick timeline here so you'll know when we are and a snapshot of some of the works that uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but these are some of the things that I look at in the book manuscript. So the, the work of the five dynasties in Northern Song on the Tang literary legacy proceeds in roughly three periods. One is the late 10th century, the, the reaccumulation of texts, the stabilizing and the, the creation of the great Northern Song compendia like Wen Yu Yinghua, Taiping Guangji, for example, Tsefu Yuangui, Taiping Yulan. And then, and this is a moment of kind of intense cultural eclecticism in the early Northern Song court. The next important period is really a period from about the 1020s, 1030s to about the 1050s, 1060s, um, which is a period when we see the maturation of an important generation of Song literati um, who had been trained in the civil service examination and had very uh, activist and informed opinions about um, how to shape, oops, how to shape governance and literary culture. The attention to the Tang also becomes acute with the uh, accession to the throne of Song Emperor Renzong, who was a boy at his accession and uh, was uh, controlled by the Dowager Empress uh, until 1033. And so scholars needing to educate Renzong in Tang cultural history, and the, the history, the political history of the Tang and Tang literature, really began to scrutinize the records of the Tang um, much more critically. And that was the call begins to uh, revise the old Tang history. We see also the expansion from the 1030s on of efforts to compile individual editions of Tang literary works. And this, this effort really peaks in the 1050s, 1060s, 1070s. We get to roughly the end of the 11th century, and this is, this is the period um, of obviously the vicious factional politics that arise in the Northern Song. And this turn towards factional politics was also accompanied by a significant scholarly and intellectual turn to the reevaluation of the classics as officials sought defenses for their positions in competing definitions of the shared tradition. And so what happens here is that by the late Northern Song, the late Northern Song is of course also the, the moment of brilliance of Northern Song writing, uh, the period of, of Ouyang Xiu, Su Shi, Wang An Shi, Sima Guang, to just name a, a Wang Dijian. But by the, by the late Northern Song, the center of literary scrutiny had shifted away from the Tang and towards presentist debates and classical reexaminations. And of course, the most decisive rupture here is the Jurchen invasion, 1127, and the subsequent Song move south. This cataclysmic humiliation with its dislocations and cultural losses forced a new reckoning. And with respect to the textual archive, forced new efforts to preserve and stabilize the Song past and to reach back even before the Tang to think about earlier medieval culture as well. So the fall of the Northern Song marks what I see as the epical construction of the Tang literary tradition that had begun in 10th century collecting and printing. And the Southern Song really marks new approaches to the Tang. All right, so the, let's see, where am I? The, um, book project, just a, a brief comment about this. Most reception history uh, scholarship on Tang literature has to date focused on single author and edition studies. Important work that has established some consistent patterns of collection, collating, and printing for different Tang writers. So my work takes a, a slightly different tack on the problem, focusing on larger scale organizations of knowledge about Tang literature that were printed and came to enjoy wide circulation anthologies of Tang poetry and prose, depictions of literature found in the biographies of the Old Tang history and New Tang history, the Jiu Tang Shu and Xin Tang Shu, and anecdote collections that are composed during the Song from Tang sources. Now, the impact of these different forms of Tang literary knowledge stemmed from their varying relationships to state power and perceived authority, which in turn affected their ability to circulate. These works also share some new common goals in reading Tang literature. We find a new interest in identifying normative styles and didactic literary models. We see a desire to create consistent and stable Tang authors and an increasingly urgent exploration of the interaction between the personal and the political with special attention to the impact of writing on the state. 
So Song readings of the Tang tradition become both more historicist and narrower over time, and biography and chronology loom larger, in part thanks to the outsized influence of the new Tang history. So in these new compilations of Tang literary knowledge, we see that sense of ownership being reflected in innovative and highly interventionist strategies of reframing. Even more importantly, when we read across the works over time, what we see is feedback loops beginning to emerge that are amplified in successive generations, where the new anthologies and biographies, for example, once put into circulation, go on to influence other works downstream. And we'll see this in the case studies. So I want to give you a, a, an orientation into one Song reader's views of Tang writers and texts. So this is a very well-known passage from a postface by Northern Song scholar Ouyang Xiu, which is appended to a collection of the mid-Tang writer Han Yu's works. We find a complex convergence here of the anxiety of the Song scholar about the fragility of the past, the reformer's ideological critique of contemporary writing, which he is going to fix by using Han Yu, and the collector's pleasure in ancient artifacts. So I won't read all of this. This is the, the opening of the colophon where he talks about the moment of discovery as a child, where he discovers the old edition of Han Yu's works. But he's still young, and so he sees it's profound and brilliant, but he's not yet ready to understand, to plumb its depths. Um, the center section of the colophon, which I haven't put here, is basically an intellectual autobiography. He talks about deepening his understanding of Han Yu and sharing it and teaching it to other people as part of the, this transformative moment of Gu Wen, of the writing of antiquity in the mid 11th century. So this is both an intellectual, Han Yu is, excuse me, Ouyang Xiu is presenting himself as both the intellectual and material mediator of Han Yu's work. So there's kind of a double argument here. On the one hand, because Han Yu's writing truly conveys the way, Ouyang says, that it will endure, even if it lapses into obscurity for a brief moment. But on the other hand, Ouyang Xiu presents his textual and editorial interventions, his collection, which arose from his commitment to Han Yu and his texts, as a necessary act of cultural redemption and renewal, not just a kind of bookish pastime. And so this is the conclusion of the, of the um, colophon, where he talks about uh, going around and collecting. If anyone has a good edition, he goes and copies uh, in order to correct his own copy. And his, his copy of this edition is now exploding. It can't even hold all of these editions that he's making uh, to it. And he says, my house now has 10,000 yuan of books, but only the collection of Han Changli is an old thing, a jiu wu. Alas, the writing and way of Han Yu will be revered by myriad generations, and thus everyone in the world will transmit them. But I especially cherish this copy because it is an old thing. Along with the collector's pride here, we see the continuing value of the manuscript copy as a source of knowledge. As Ron Egan has noted, the real scholar or true connoisseur of books prided himself on copying them after editing and collating them. The act of copying was an important not just to demonstrate one's commitment to books, but also to the process of learning and mastering their contents. And I think Ouyang Xiu's colophon captures the reverence that many Song readers felt for Tang literary manuscripts as objects, but it also underscores their belief in the necessity of their work on the raw material of Tang texts and their pleasure in fashioning new forms. So we'll continue with Han Yu here as a case study. Um, so the basic facts, obviously, Han Yu is very, very well known in the Chinese tradition. He's a very important, vigorous, innovative, iconoclastic mid-Tang writer of prose and also of poetry, and known for the revival of the Confucian way in the in the early eighth, excuse me, early ninth century. And during his lifetime, he assembled a circle of followers who. Uh, with whom he exchanged texts, and after his death, they continued to promote and advocate uh, Han Yu's reputation and his impact on the world of Wenzhang. Now, we see in the late Five Dynasties and early Northern Song the emergence of uh, more followers of Han Yu who begin to collect his work and create new editions of his work. 
And the beginning of a kind of cult of Hanyu is, is already recognizable by the late 10th century, and certainly, certainly as we creep into the, uh, the early 11th century. Now, Hanyu appears as a towering figure in the early Northern Song anthology Wen Cui, literature's finest, which only later comes to be known as the Tang Wen Cui. The anthology was compiled in 1011 by a private individual, a scholar official named Yao Xuan. Although explicitly modeled on the Wenxuan, the Liang Dynasty anthology, the Wenxuan is almost three times its size, 2,000 individual texts by 362 writers, organized in 19 genre categories and divided into 100 zhen, which is significant. Now, in his selections, Yao Xuan famously excluded both regulated poetry and parallel prose, which is to say two of the most important and common forms of Tang literature from the anthology. The preface is dated to 1011. It was presented to the throne in uh, 1020 after his death, and then it was printed in 1039. And we have a considerable amount of evidence from the Northern and Southern Song of its wide circulation and its impact. And it goes through multiple editions in the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties and circulates outside of China. Now we see the veneration of Han Yu and other mid-Tang writers in the preface to the anthology. And this is just one portion. It's a very long and interesting preface. He says, Director of Personnel Han Yu's greatness soared above the crowd. Only he re revered deepest antiquity, taking the two emperors and three kings as his foundation and the six classics and four teachings as his venerated teacher. From this height, he surpassed all others and was first to chant the literature of antiquity, the Gu Wen. He checked the, relentless, the restless flow of confusion and opened up the correct way, the Zheng Dao, through his calm honesty. So what we see here, actually, is Yao Xuan making a, both a literary historical and an ideological argument about Han Yu. So he centers the peak of Tang literature in the mid-Tang, and he includes other mid-Tang writers, uh, and, and grounds it in this, what he claims is the rediscovery of the Confucian way in, in the mid-Tang texts. Now, aside from the praise in the preface, we see the claims for Han Yu's importance then being substantiated in this new genre category of Gu Wen, which contains 189 pieces of prose. There are eight zhen of Gu Wen, and they open with these texts. They open with five Han Yu prose compositions on origins, the Yuan Dao, obviously the, the Yuan Dao, Yuan Xing, etc. Now, the Yuan Dao had long been regarded as the major statement of Han Yu's social and political thought. And these essays as a group were written in an entirely new essay style. But though Han Yu at various moments discussed something called Gu Wen with his disciples and friends, and he sketched out in various places how it might be practiced, neither he nor the executor of his collection, Li Han, ever specifically identified any of these pieces under a rubric called so this is one of the most influential achievements of the Wen Cui, selecting certain Tang texts based on Han Yu's model, defining them as Gu Wen, and placing Han at the head of the lineage, which sort of trademarks Han Yu as the inventor of Gu Wen in a lasting way. But the final strategies that I think make the Wen Cui vision of Tang literature so coherent are the subtler implicit cues for reading that actually pervade the text which not only give us hierarchies of literary value, but draw the outlines of a retrospectively imagined Tang literati community. And this is especially true in its treatment of Han Yu. So uh, for example, Yao Xuan, uh, he, is, he organizes the anthology by genre, and then beneath that level of organization by topoi, by lei, by topic matter. Um, but this allows him actually to ignore chronology. So he's, he, he feels free to repeat authors anywhere he likes, even within a single gen. And he does this with Han Yu and the other mid-Tang writers. But there's another really wonderful feature here, which is the intratextuality, uh, which is a very powerful tool in the collection. So not only does he include dozens of texts by Han Yu, but we also have at least 17 more texts about him. And this is some of the examples. And these are all texts that praise Han Yu and commemorate him in very admiring ways. 
So Yashen uses multiple strategies to defend Han Yu's significance in the anthology, praising him in the preface, including 76 of his own compositions, putting him at the head of a brand new genre, and finally recruiting other voices from the Mid-Tang literati community to commemorate him. I focused on the example of Han Yu here in the Wen Cui because we see so clearly how he is produced as a Tang luminary across the text. But we can see the same strategies of organization and recursion and intertextuality being used to promote other mid Tang writers, such as Liu Zongyuan and Quan De Yu. As far as we know, there had been nothing like the Wen Cui in the Tang, whether in its exclusive preference for old style verse and non parallelistic prose or in its reverence for an antiquity-centered reading of Tang literary culture. But we know that later, from the print history of Wen Sui, that later readers found this very persuasive. Perhaps surprisingly, the best represented poet in the Wen Sui is not a mid-Tang writer, but the high Tang poet Li Bai, whose old-style poetry, Yue Fu, and prose texts are represented across the anthology in great numbers, and it's to him and his biography that we turn next. Now, the Tang poet Li Bai needs very little introduction to this audience, um, particularly for scholars who have written extensively on him, including on his reception history. Known for his vigorous and bold and innovative poetry and also for his outsized personality, Li Bai gained fame within and well beyond the literary scene at Tang Emperor Xuanzong's court before the Anlushan Rebellion, and his poems, such as The Road to Shu, uh, The Hardships of the Road to Shu Shu Danan, and Chang Jinjiu, Bring in the Wine, circulated throughout the empire in lots of different forms. A few facts about his life. He lived a very peripatetic life as a young man traveling throughout China, and though he was summoned to serve at Xuanzong's court, he lasted there barely two years. His life during the rebellion took a troubling turn. In 756, in the initial years of the fighting, Li Bai served as an advisor to Li Lin, who was the Prince of Yong. Um, who was uh, competing with later Tang uh, Emperor Suzong for control of the throne. When Li Lin, when the Prince of Yong was defeated, Li Bai was imprisoned, later released, and died in obscurity. Now, the sources on how Li Bai's late years unfold are hard to reconcile, which we're going to see. But it's useful to reflect a moment on what versions of Li Bai were circulating up through the mid-11th century, as far as we can determine. We can say with some confidence that Li Bai was among the best surviving of Tang poets by the middle of the Northern Song. Uh, during the Tang, we have evidence of at least three collections, two compiled immediately after his death, and then another one in 817, none of which survive. And so we, we, we need to assume that during the Tang, people largely had access to Li Bai's poetry through the oral tradition and through smaller collections, the Xiaoji of his verse. And he's also well represented in several uh, Tang anthologies that survive into the Song. So Li Bai was certainly in his lifetime his, his own best publicist, frequently boasting of his own brilliance and fame. And perhaps not surprisingly, this is echoed in the praise of Li Bai by later Tang readers and by the many anecdotes that circulated about him during the Tang. Now, where the eulogistic works promoted Li Bai's dazzling, unparalleled literary skill and style, the anecdotes tended to celebrate his wild behavior, his drinking, and his impoverished end. And Li Bai's poetry, of course, reveals an extraordinary range of topics and styles and forms. You could invent many, many different Li Bai's out of the corpus itself. Now, Li Bai was very fortunate to have his collected works compiled and edited in the late 10th century by the early Northern Song scholar, originally from Southern Tang, Yue Shi, in, in, in two works, Li Hanlin Ji and Li Hanlin Bie Ji. Although no firm copy of Yosha's edition of Li Bai's collection survives, we do have a preface and a postface, and Yosha also composed a Li Bai Zhuan, which no longer survives. But it, it seems very likely that Yosha undertook the first serious Song rehabilitation of Li Bai as a historical figure, in addition to trying to stabilize his collection, and that may have in turn influenced later revisions. So we have an extant Tang through early Northern Song sources, multiple and inconsistent versions of Li Bai, including in his biography in the Old Tang history. And this messy record posed a very serious challenge for Song readers attempting to rationalize 
the corpus and the life in stable forms. So we see these challenges in the very brief 300 word Jiu Tan Shu biography of Li Bai, which is really just kind of a mashup of different stories about the poet and quotations from various sources. Now, although the biography repeats He Zhizhang's famous characterization of Li Bai as the Zhejian Ren, and in credits him with having a, a stalwart spirit that was vast and carefree and a soaring desire to transcend the world, it only mentions his literary work in association with his drinking. In fact, the chief theme of this biography is drunkenness. The word jiu appears six times and drunk zui no fewer than four. And out of 300 words, that's a lot. Now, one famous story about Li Bai being hauled into Emperor Xuanzong's presence to compose poetry has him being pulled out of a tavern. And uh, another, which quotes two 9th century anecdotes, shows Li Bai insulting the uh, eunuch advisor Gao Li Shi by ordering him to take off his boots. But the most serious charge in the biography that scholars are still debating ad nauseum is whether Li Bai sought a position with the Prince of Yong. And also that after his release from prison, as it says here, in the end, due to his excessive drinking, he died of drunkenness in Xuancheng. Now, where the revision of the uh, when the revision of the Jiu Tang Shu, including all of its biographies, was undertaken, was commanded by Renzong in the mid 11th century, Li Bai was certainly among the writers whose accounts needed reworking. But more importantly, for my purposes. The refurbishing that Li Bai gets is entirely consistent with the other improvements made across the board to Tang literati biographies in the Xin Tang Shu. So Li Bai's exceptionalist reputation did not preclude him from refashioning. On the contrary, the very importance of such a great Tang poet demanded that he be revised. Now, the, the Jiu Tang Shu was compiled in the, ten, in the 940s, excuse me, in one of the five dynasty successor states to the Tang, the latter Jin dynasty, presented to the throne in 945. Um, it is, of course, compiled from sources from uh, successive periods of the Tang and, and is very messy, inconsistent in places. And as we move into the 11th century, it was increasingly seen as a problem and in need of desperate revision. And this was ordered in 1045. So what became known as the Xin Tang Shu, the replacement official history, was completed by a team of historians over the next 15 years, presented to the Song court in 1060 and immediately printed. Though Ouyang Xiu is credited as the chief, chief historian and was responsible for the annals and the general integrity of the work, the historian Song Qi, an official widely respected for his literary and editorial skills, was given chief responsibility, and Ouyang Xiu says full responsibility, for revising the biographies. And his revisions were systematic and thoroughgoing. Whether within the biographies of Tang officials or in the Wen Yi, the literary biographies, literary arts biographies, which included Li Bai and Du Fu, Song Qi revised the Jiu Tang Shu portraits of literary composition to depict Wen Zhang as the manifestation of individual moral integrity and political loyalty. He consistently reduced the, the visibility of literary writing. He shortened or cut quotations from primary sources. He deleted titles of texts and notes about the size or the content of people's literary collections. And he rarely mentioned textual sources when including a quotation from another author, for example. All of these were details that the Jiu Tang Shu biographies included. But more significantly for conceptions of authorship, the Xin Tang Shu biographies are more coherent as narratives. Song Qi creates internally consistent explanations for individual actions by omitting inconsistencies and counter evidence, throws the counter evidence out, and also inserting new judgments to guide the reader. But following the age old practice of historians before him, Song Qi more often chose to simply delete the negative examples or minimize them greatly and amplify his positive moral models. So in the case of Li Bai's Xin Tang Shu biography, as in so many others, we see all of these techniques marshaled to improve the poet's reputation, influence, and historical stature. Song Qi doubles the biography in length. He adds information on Li Bai's lineage, a little dubious, adds new anecdotes, and depletes, excuse me, deletes critical depictions of Li Bai's conduct. <clears throat> 
So although Levi is still drunk, he's still hauled in drunk in front of Emperor Xuanzong to compose poems, he is depicted as using drunkenness at court in a highly strategic way, this uh, form of a uh, very venerated form of reclusion at court, a kind of a protest against the increasingly troubled Tianbao moment. Now, Song Qi also adds a new anecdote about Li Bai encountered the, encountering the renowned uh, general uh, Guo Zi, the hero of the rebellion earlier before the rebellion, where he aided Guo Zi. Guo Zi recognizes Li Bai's moral integrity, and he then is the one who redeems and releases Li Bai from prison after he's imprisoned for treason. So this is a kind of uh, uh, acclamation and, and a promotion of Li Bai's integrity. But the Xintang Shu biography does not end with Li Bai's ignominious drunken death. Instead, Song Qi concludes by adding praise of Li Bai taken from those eulogies composed by Tang writers in the late 8th and early 9th centuries. So this redemption of Li Bai's character and posthumous reputation is not focused on his poetry or his literary skills, but it's focused on repackaging him as a more admirable Tang figure. And Li Bai's revised biography is by no means as hagiographic as some of the other revisions, particularly in the cases of Han Yu and, and Du Fu. But its new form is entirely consistent with the ideological and literary strategies that Song Qi deploys throughout the New Tang history to create exemplary figures. All right, our last case study. So Li Bai was a messy challenge in part due to the miscellaneous and contradictory nature of the sources that survived the Tang about him. But the messiness of the Song record for Tang writers is even more challenging in this final case study, the late Tang poet Wen Tingyun. And here's a slide just to remind us where we are. And this is the text we're talking about. So here, we need to not start with Wen Tingyun, but actually with the collection itself, the Tang Shi Ji Shi, the records of events concerning Tang literature, a truly unusual early Southern Song compilation. The Tang Shi Ji Shi was, as far as we know, the first compilation of Tang literature to collect historical and anecdotal materials on Tang writers chronologically in the format of dynastic history biographies, and to include the writer's own poems in the manner of anthologies. So the structure of the collection reveals its ambition and scope. In the 81 chapters con containing the 1,150 poets, uh, so we see the first two emperors are, first two uh, Jen are devoted to Tang emperors, followed by uh, uh, Jen on empresses and consorts, and then it moves chronologically through Tang history, concluding with a handful of Buddhist monks, women, and recluse poets. So we have no evidence of any previous Song anthology, let alone Tang anthology, or anecdote collection of this breadth or diversity. And the only Tang anthology of this nature that seems to have survived into the Northern Song was a 10th century work, Cai Diao Ji, which also includes monks and women, but no emperors. And it was an important source text for Tang Shi Ji Shi. Now, the compiler, Ji Yogong, left very few historical traces. We know he passed the Jin Shi in 1121, just before the fall of the Northern Song. So his early education is actually undertaken in the Northern Song. And then he served in the Southern Song Imperial Archives for more than 20 years, with a decade away from the capital in the 1140s, where he apparently began compiling the work. And so in 1162, he has a final transfer to, to Sichuan, to, to Meishan. Uh, which is where he was originally from, and he spent the rest of his life there, dying perhaps in the 1170s. And so it is actually a later person, one Wang Shi, who obtains the manuscript copy from his youngest son and has it printed in 1224. From that first printing, however, it goes on to multiple reprintings and it spawns multiple imitations in later dynasties. So, the Tang Shi Ji Shi preface, which is actually fairly short, begins with what we should recognize now as a typical statement uh, or, or a lament about loss, the countless numbers of Tang writers whose works have been lost. And then we get a, a, an account of Ji Yogong's own labor to compile this work. Living in retirement, I sought throughout 300 years of history, 300 years of literary collections, miscellaneous accounts, 
biographies, private histories, epitaphs and steles, even down to couplets or lines that have been transmitted orally. And I selected from them, examined, copied, and recorded them. In addition to including their works so that their persons could be examined here, I roughly recorded the outline of their good characters in the hope that by reading the poetry, one may know the person. And it's the oldest bromide in the book about poetry, right? So I think Ji Gong reveals here a very characteristic song relentlessness in his efforts to acquire materials on Tang poets and his desire to showcase poets of good character. But nowhere in the preface, which is short, does he explain his selection principles, his personal tastes, or how he organizes the material within individual entries. So all of this has to be inferred from reading the collection. Now, what makes that challenging is that within these 1150 entries, we find highly variable quotation and selection strategies and very few linear narr narratives. The text doesn't really tell us how to read it in the same way that other texts do. So I should emphasize that although political history and biography create a kind of a top level order for the text, any, any attempt to discern, discern a real system as you move from entry to entry is doomed to failure because the text displays a truly provocative hybridity. By culling such different forms of knowledge about Tang literature, the entries sometimes reveal tensions among sources. Sometimes biographies and anecdotes serve to contextualize poems, but at other times the poems suggest other ways of reading the poet. In the entry for Wen Tingyun, the disparate pieces of the poet's reputation stand in productive tension with one another, I think. And they ask us to reflect critically on how the components of political history and anecdote and poetry could be mobilized to create new knowledge. So in the case here of Wen Tingyun, unlike the cases of Han Yu and Li Bai at the end of the Northern Song, we have to realize that the textual record as Ji Yo Gong saw it was highly fragmented. We know from Song bibliographical records that the poetry survived in partial and multiple editions. And even Wen Tingyun's biographies in the Two Tang histories are, are, don't disclose very much. They're very brief. They contain few facts and are heavy with gossipy stories. So he lived, Wen Tingyun lived approximately from 812 to 866. He was descended from a very prominent early Tang official family, but he never passed the examinations and he gained a reputation for licentious behavior. But he left a beautiful body of poems, many in song forms, including early examples of the Tsi, the song lyric genre. So asking what did Wen Tingyun look like to early 12th century readers is itself an impossible question to answer. In fact, in Tang Shi Ji Shi, the attention paid to Wen Tingyun itself is new. Ji Yogong was apparently the first Song scholar to try to collect and rationalize the available evidence for Wen Tingyun's life and poetry. So the entry is not long and the printed edition is about two and a half pages. It makes it about medium length compared to the, the kind of average of, of entries. But it's interesting because it reverses some key patterns that we see elsewhere um, in the collection. It opens with an excerpt from Wen Tingyun's brief New Tang History biography, and it closes with three poems, um, very judiciously ex selected examples of Wen's poetry. In between, however, it quotes from two poems that provide evidence of Wen's uh, interest in song forms, and by extension, his decadent playboy inclinations, and it includes anecdotes with explicit condemnation of Wen's character and tastes. So in this entry, we see Jiu Gong, I think, wrestling with some of the intractable elements in Wen's reputation and political career, but attempting in the end to redeem the poetry in order to defend his inclusion of Wen Tingyun in the book. So the opening frame for the entry, which is the, this brief quotation from the New Tang History biography, is not especially promising as a start. Um, this biographical sketch establishes the theme for much of what follows. Wen was a poet of noble ancestry who frittered away his demonstrated literary talent in drinking and never rose to high position. Now, the entry as a whole, it's all, all of its eight passages, basically front loads the negative evidence uh, in, in the first half. And so the two poems that follow this opening are not, this is just the second of them, 
um, are not illustrations of Wen Tingyun's social conduct, that, so they don't uh, constitute events in a narrative fashion as shi. Um, they are, in fact, songs, they're ge and qu, that exemplify Wen's stylistic tastes and formal skills. So the first poem, not here, uh, is an elaborate and ornate stanzaic ballad on the experience of uh, listening to music at Tang Xuanzong's court. And the next, this one, Yang Chun Chu, the Song of Sunny Spring, uh, is, is a verse to the Yue Fu tune. Now, these two songs capture the synesthetic, semantically dense, and fragmented style that characterizes much of Wen Tingyun's extant poetry, including his romantic song lyrics. And I would note that the song lyrics are actually alluded to in one of the anecdotes, but are not quoted here. The feminine imagery in both poems, their attention to rich surfaces and the evocation here of a lover's parting, all give substance to the charge, which is repeated in a subsequent anecdote, that Wen's literary talent was lush and beautiful, which is to say decadent and morally suspect. Now, the portrait of Wen as a wastrel but talented scion of a noble clan is underscored by the anecdotes that follow, which is, there, this is a long interwoven series of stories that are copied from the 10th century anecdote collection, Bei Meng Suoyan. Now, the anecdotes serve to illustrate Wen Tingyun's moral deficiencies in part. He helped people cheat, he was arrogant, dismissive, and sharp-tongued, and that these failings culminated in his insulting the Tang Emperor Xuanzong, in, who was wandering around Chang'an in disguise, as he was wont to do. Uh, which, and this insulting of the emperor leads to Wen Tingyun's condemnation and disgrace in the anecdote. And he never succeeded in passing the examinations. Now, I mean, I have to say, in terms of, 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 of uh, of a takedown in a course uh, across the course of Tang Shi Jisha, it hardly gets worse than being taken out by an emperor, being told that you are deficient in moral conduct, and even though you are talented, it's not sufficient to make up for that deficiency. So, despite their illustration of Wen Tingyun's bad judgment, there are positive features given in other anecdotes about Wen Tingyun as a poet, a poet of erudition and wit and facility someone who quite reasonably mocked the pretension and ignorance of high officials like Lin Hutao, who could rapidly compose uh, full and parallel couplets, beautiful parallel couplets on demand, even for the emperor. So whether they depict him as admired, exploited, or condemned, the stories as a whole very energetically attest to Wen Tingyun's fame as a poet in his own day, even if one of dubious character. But, the three poems that conclude the entry offer yet another perspective on Wen as poet that challenges the portrait created to this point. Rather than extending the oppression of Wen's lush, beautiful style, the final three poems, all regulated verses in the seven character line, are evocative poems of historical reflection. These are huai gu shi, on sites associated with three great heroes of Chinese history. As was common in Huai Gu verse, all three implicate Wen Tingyun himself as a visitor to the historical sites. The first is a poem on passing by Five Stave Plain, where the famous Three Kingdoms general Zhuge Liang died after his last battle. The second is on passing by Xinfeng, the rebuilt village of Liu Bang, the first Han emperor. And then finally here, a melancholic poem on the temple for Han diplomat and loyalist Su Wu. So these familiar historical topoi are handled in what I think we would now characterize as a quiet version of late Tang style, lyrical and imagistic rather than narrative, emotionally understated, ambivalent about the moral lessons of history, and more concerned with the thematics of loss and remnants than with the great hero's patriotism or historical achievements. In these three poems, we see Wen Tingyun as a poet not merely of erotic, beautiful vignettes, but one capable of serious and important historical reflection. It also seems no coincidence that the closing poem included in this 12th century collection for, in the entry for Wen Tingyun, compiled by a man who had personally survived the Jurchen invasion of the Northern Song, concerns the Han official Su Wu. Su Wu, like the Northern Song Emperor Huizong, 
was held captive by the Xiongnu in the north for 19 years. But unlike Huizong, who died after nine years in Jin captivity, Su Wu was able to return. Though, as the poem reminds us, his return was fraught with the losses and bitterness over the passage of time. This poem surely resonated deeply with Jiu Gong's Southern Song readers. So the playboy reputation that so vividly informs the first, the two thirds of the entry is questioned and I think partly undermined through these final three poems, which are presented as redemptive, alternative examples of the poet's talent. Despite the emperor's harsh dismissal, the poems provided here forestall a simple moralistic reading or even a definitive conclusion about Wen Tingyun, which is what makes this entry like so many others in Tang Shi Ji Shi, a compelling text in its own right. So, to conclude. What I've tried to give you today is a sense of the complex and interwoven concerns that Song Literati brought to their reconceptualizations of Tang literary writing and Tang authors in these large-scale compilations of literary knowledge. As I noted at the outset, readers' approaches to the Tang became more intensely biographical, historicist, and political. And as their familiarity with and material possession of the Tang deepened, they engaged the literary record in increasingly interventionist ways, seeking to produce narrower, perhaps more refined definitions of Tang Wenzhang as models for their own work. It's in this respect that I think we can see these scholars sustaining a mutually constitutive and, and symbiotic relationship with Tang literature. Tang literature becomes not just good to think with, but essential to think with throughout this transformative moment of Chinese history. So I will leave you with this image, which is taken from the Northern Song poet and calligraphers, uh, Huang Tingjian's calligraphy for his nephew, Zhang Datong, which Huang Tingjian wrote after copying out one of Han Yu's essays as an example of Gu Wen for Zhang. We are fortunate to still possess Huang Tingjian's vigorous but poised artistry in the scroll, a quintessential example of a Song artist inspired to new creativity by a Tang predecessor. But in a poignant twist of transmission history, though we have Huang Tingjian's colophon here in the scroll, the other half, his copy of Han Yu's essay, has long been lost. And I'll stop here for today. So uh, thanks very much to Professor Shields for a very simulating talk, um, much appreciated. And uh, I think that today I will just uh, talk about a, two or three trains of thought that are started for me in reading the paper and in hearing you deliver it just now, and then open the floor for uh, what I hope will be a stimulating discussion that can involve the whole group. Um, in general, the paper reminds me of something that I often think about, which is that it's maybe an anomalous feature of the discipline of literary history that I think it really works best when we suspend any idea that we know what literature is. Um, that is, if we put a black box around those moments when someone is claiming or being granted cultural cachet, prestige, authority, um, getting ahead, getting behind based on writing. If we just put a black box around all those things and not be in a rush to define it and name it and just kind of see what, hang out there and see what's going on. Um, and this seems to be a nice example of that to really show that um, across this two or 300 year period of a, of a very pivotal moment in the formation of what we come to know in modern day literary textbooks as literary history um, is in fact a very highly contingent process that is not a matter of someone writing something down at one moment, but is rather a collaborative stream of back and forth and negotiation and uh, various kinds of interventions and dialogues that, um, you know, constantly at every turn we're reminded it, it could have been otherwise. Um, so this is a very fascinating sort of a case study, a complex and w wide ranging case study of this, this sort of general feature of what I find about my favorite work in literary history is this 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 notion of okay let's 
one of the things we're doing is let's let's think about what literature means and what it can mean. Um, <clears throat> I'm also reminded, I think, not to be contentious, but to open up discussion. I, re I remember this, the term that you used about the late 11th century when you see a pivot away from discussion of Tang Dynasty authors as the core of discussions around literary value in, this, in the Northern Song. You describe that as a turn to more presentist uh, concerns. And so not in the spirit of, of disputatiousness, but in the spirit of promoting a conversation, I would propose that it was always presentist. Um, and so what I have in mind is this sort of a tunnel effect that we see when we look at this, the relationship between Ouyang Xiu and Hanyu is one of the most important relationships in the entire history of really medieval literature, especially as it comes to be remembered. This is where, this is the mother and father of the big, the eight masters, you know. So, um, so by the mirroring effect I have in mind, for example, the role that Hanyu is playing not just writing a certain kind of text, but also in help, being quite involved in the cementing, for example, of the, the duopoly of Li and Du in the poetic history of the, of the dynasty. Um, and also by his, his uh, joining, his consciously and explicitly joining of whatever we describe as literary practices being with a sort of oppositional cultural stance and with the active cultivation of a social circle and a circle of disciples. And so what I think is, comes to mind here is 1057. Because um, the, the same Ouyang Xiu who is identifying and treasuring and advocating and claiming to understand Han Yu is doing the same moves in a certain way, in a, in a Northern Song way. And that's ten, the 1057 Jinshu examination when we have the arrival of these guys from this backwater who we've later come to know a little bit with the surname Su. This is this is this pivotal moment where Hai Yu is in charge of the examination and he is he is really this is a moment where we really can say this is especially in terms of the way this comes to be remembered, this is this is pivotal in our understanding of what, I mean to this day, this is how the textbooks go. Because this is what's important in uh, in Northern Song literary uh, history. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I also I, I really appreciated and, and enjoyed the, the the textured treatment of this the wonderful set of case studies when we can look at we have this just by by the luck of our of how the, the the transmission and the and the series of compilations of these historical accounts work we have a whole bunch of biographies to compare the 940s version and then the mid 11th century version when we have the Jiu Tang Shu and Xin Tang Shu and I think that that what you've done. Uh, with your focus on specifically the literary biographies is to show that it's not simply a matter of the sort of fleshing out. We see a lot of fleshing out of, of accounts based on subsequent, you know, post mid 10th century anecdotal tradition. Um, but rather in the case of literary biographies, we really can see a reconfiguration in effect of the, de the definition of the genre of the literary, literary biography. And hand in hand with that, in, in effect, a redefinition or a, a rearticulation of the category of authorship. That is the authorship as, as, as the status of the, the person whose life you have to really understand as the, as the pivot for an engagement with, the literary, with a literary work. So both literature and author are being redefined in this, in this process. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think that, um, one thing that would be interesting to add to the picture here is, is we've talked, you discuss um, in, in, very, in very illuminating fashion the big compilations of the Northern Song, the Tang Wen Sui, the Wen Yu Hua, Taiping Guangji, um, and then later the Tang Shi Ji Shi. There's a really big one in there that I think would be interesting to try to fit in, and that's the Tsefu Yuan Gui. Because the Tsavu Yangui, this is 1013. I looked it up. <laughs> um, 1013, and and it's a, it's a very unwieldy text because it's the, it's bigger than all of them. So it's a very unwieldy text to try to deal with, and it but it has it has a nice family of paratexts that shed a lot of light on the underlying conception of what it's about. And so I think this is another thing we could think about: is what an anthology is not an anthology is not an anthology. Um, so we, an anthology is not 
ipso facto, by definition, um, a record of literary history, whatever we mean by that. An anthology can be all sorts of things, including, I think the boundary between the anthology and the leishu is a very interesting one to think about. That is, an anthology is, is, can be a reservoir of material. And that's, in fact, arguably one of the primary functions of the anthology, is it's, it's a reservoir of material. And it's not, the authors can be listed or not listed, but in effect, it's material for use. Um, and I think the, the Tsefu Yungwe and the, the history of the, the, the court-sponsored compilation of Tsefu Yungwe, I would include in the paratext of the Tsefu Yungwe the Xi Chang, uh, the Xi Kun Chou Chang Ji, the, the anthology of poetry, which is kind of, in terms of its origins and in terms of the way it's presented, this is the kind of poetry that that kind of wenren would produce in their spare time or in, in their banqueting time. And I think that, that little universe um, is, a, is a very nice counterpoint. And of course, this, in a way, this is rehashing. I think we have to not be afraid to, of simply rehashing the old the version of the literary histories where we say this is, this is basically the bad, this is the bad literature of the early Northern Song and then it becomes good magically in the middle of the 11th century. I think we can not be afraid of the inanity of that narrative if we, if we actually engage with figuring out, again, what's going on in that black box because there's really interesting stuff. And it's, that's, a plausible, that's a plausible path not taken that I think would be interesting to add, include in some way, because I think that would really bring out, again, more forcefully the, the, the kind of mystery of this, things that happened in, in, in terms of these moments that you're getting into in the study. They, it could have been otherwise. And that's a really interesting thing to think about in history in general. So those are just some of my preliminary thoughts, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, just because I know people will have a lot of questions, and I'd like to get into general conversation. So, so but thanks again, and it was it was a wonderful read, and, and thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah. So, Robert, thank you so much. The, uh, I'm very glad this was recorded because I just wanted to listen, and so I'll get to. I, I didn't take notes, but I just got to listen. I just want to say one last thing. Thank you so much about about Sifu Yungwe, and and I've actually been very very invested in precisely that inane literary historical narrative of the early Northern Song, and going back to and seeing Wen's way, even though I presented something like the kind of traditional view of Wen's way, um, I looked at Wen's way from another perspective in an article that's coming out in a book that comes out next year, um, thinking about his representation of Taoist Topoi um, in the Shenzhen, and arguing that that in fact if we look harder at Wen's way, it's much more diverse verse and typical of early Northern Song um, cu cultural richness and eclecticism, then it goes on to be, uh, to be read. Um, I think the, the reception of Wen's Way is actually different from its, from its initial formation and origins. But anyway, I want to look at both for sure. That's the, the, I think there, and Xi Kun Chou Chuanji, the, the preface as well, yeah, and in its relationship to Li Shangyi. So thank you at any rate. Um, but the floor is open, so I'd, I'd love to hear questions. Uh, yeah, and just a quick announcement before we do questions. Since we're recording, we're going to pass around the microphone just so we can make sure that we can accurately record your question. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over. Thank you um, for this interesting talk. I'm just going to be the icebreaker with the first question, which might lead away. Um, thank you again for your talk, but I couldn't help and be reminded by this trend that we can now see going on within the song, reminiscing about the Tang and draw a comparison to what happens in the Ming mm -hmm. with the song. And I just wondered if you can say some words how that might like how you see like a reoccurrence of this trend or how we can place that. Thank well, you. so I, I would not be foolish as to talk about the Ming. I would be so foolish as to as to take up the Ming, but I will say that I do think, um, uh, you know, I've made a very strong, bold, and and contestable argument about the Song relationship to this Tang as being, I said, mutually constitutive and, and kind of symbiotic in in ways that were unlike in the tradition. But I also think that their relationship to the Tang, because it was so famous and negotiated so publicly across so many corpora, does serve as a model in later dynasties for how you renegotiate your relationship with the, with the cultural past. So there, I think, um, the impact is great. I mean, I, I really would not presume to speak of the Ming, but um, I, I, I would argue that um, the practices of imitation 
a poetic imitation, stylistic imitation that happened in the Northern Song of Tang predecessors um, also stand as interesting models and not necessarily ones to imitate in, in later dynasties that perhaps they seem somewhat simplistic, but I'm not going to venture much further than that. I do think, though, that this stands as a very important, it's a moment of reception and renegoti renegotiation that survives so vividly in the Northern Song textual record, um, and, and people go back to it to think about what that looks like. Yeah. Paula. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to, to say that was so much fun and beautifully done. It was. Yeah, it, I didn't get to read it, but I felt like it was a page turner. And I really appreciate <laughs> okay. that. Um, so, so turning to the uh, anthologization the, of of poetry itself, and the and you you did at one point mention the question of exemplarity, which mm -hmm. I think is really an undercurrent of a lot of what is going on here. Is is the notion of poets who are exemplary in particular ways. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering if you would go a little bit deeper into that aspect mm -hmm. of what was happening in the song and what types of poetic exemplars mm -hmm. kind of start emerging at that time that maybe were not what, uh, you know, as Robert was saying, things could have happened differently. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you see any any uh, manifestations of this particular sequence of um, gestures and events and uh, that, that gave rise to long-lasting okay. archetypes of poets, actually. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I, I actually assumed that somebody in the room would pop a hand up and say, what about Du Fu? <laughs> I kind of name-checked him a couple of times, but I didn't talk about him. So, um, I mean, one of the reasons I, I didn't talk about him in this talk is that he's been talked about, he's been written about so much and his reception history has been talked about so much. But obviously, he is the most important example in the Northern Song of a reception of a single Tang poet. I mean, as I wrote in something that I published on Li Bai, so Northern Song readers inherited Li Bai, but they made Du Fu. So they created Du Fu. They invested themselves into the shaping of Du Fu in ways that are pivotal and, and to a certain extent unique. But at the same time, as he becomes this very important poetic and kind of moral historical exemplar, um, the things, the operations that Northern Song readers undertake and editors undertake on Du Fu are very typical and consistent with the other kinds of editorial interventions that they do with other Tang poets. So th there's a Du Fu example. But I would flip your question around actually to talk about randomness and utter contingency and mention one of the anthologies I am going to talk about in the in the book, the Tang Bai Jia Shi Xuan, which might be subtitled A Collection of Poems That Song Ming Qiu Happened to Have on His Shelf. Um, because there the anthology and 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 Yang Shaoshan has written a chapter on his book on Wang An Shi about about Tang Bai Jia Shi Xuan. Um, because there the anthology both reproduces a lot of Tang and pre-mediated Tang anthology selections, copies the Qie Zhongji into um, the Tang Bai Jia Shi Xuan, and also simply, simply seems to include um, uh, types of poems on Topoi that suited their tastes, I think Su Mingqiu and Wang Anshi's tastes. So there, I think, is a terrific example of, of an anthology that actually goes on to be, people scratch their heads about it even to this day, right? So it's not... Uh, it was probably not intended to be uh, an anthology of exemplars, but a collection of shared personal tastes. So I think so. There are, are two examples, that are kind of counter examples. Um, but also, I think if we take uh, the example of Song Mingqiu, so uh, Song Mingqiu did um, ten at least ten editions of, of different Tang writers' works. And some of those were because he believed in the, the, the absolute necessity, like for example, for Meng Jiao, of saving their work and transmitting it in that same kind of deeply reverential way that we see with Han, uh, Ouyang Shou's approach to Han Yu. But some of them were simply out of personal interest. Um, we don't have the prefaces for all of them. Um, so there is, there is clearly, and when, when we look at uh, commentary on this kind of uh, activity, it's, it's a pastime as well. And, and so you may be posted to a particular place and you make a discovery of a, of a trove of poems that may stimulate your interest in that particular poet or that moment. 
that will then um, spawn literary activity. So exemplarity is absolutely, I think, a commitment of a lot of these large literary compilations, but not always. Sometimes randomness matters. Right, a lot of, a lot of it would happen retrospectively, in fact. Well, and that's what drives everybody crazy about Tom Bai Jiao Shuxuan, because Wang Anshu wrote the preface, and what was what was he intending? So there's this kind of centuries of attempts to decode Tom Bai Jiao Shuxuan, when I really think it ought to be subtitled stuff that Song Yijiu had on his bookshelf. <laughs> Yes, um, so I'll just ask a, um, a brief question. Um, I was interested, I'm, I'm always looking at um, thoroughness, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that I'm always trying to find as much stuff as possible. So that's kind of how I look at, look at everything. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if that's also, you know, where, what, mm -hmm. what's the place for that in the story? Just people who just wanna find everything. Um, and because, you know, every little tidbit is interesting and so bring it all together um you know sort of where does that fit in in some sense i would you know the, the last one you mentioned almost had more of that than some of the earlier ones mm -hmm. but it's unlikely that that's the natural last step right. of some developmental process yeah. so, so i yeah so I, yeah no I, I i can talk about that um I mean, I think uh, a, a couple of things. I, I do, I do frame Tang Shiji Shi really not so much as a, because I do think we see new directions in the compilation of Tang literature, and we see the printing, of course, of Wen Yinghua in 1204, 1201 to 1204. Um, but Tang Shiji strikes me as a very, as a culmination of a lot of trends that we see developing in the Northern Song, but also kind of a backward looking. Um, collection, not concerned with things that go on to be important in Northern Song. But his, uh, his claim of thoroughness, I think, is very much grounded in his service in the Imperial li Library. One of the fascinating things, in fact, about Tang Shiji Shi is that there's lots of evidence he had access to Wen Yun Yinghua before it was printed. Um, because there, there, there are reproductions of order and, and quotations of poets from Wen Yun Yinghua in Tang Shi Ji Shi. So this claim of thoroughness is in fact substantiated in the collection in lots of different ways. Maybe also Taiping Guang Ji. Um, that's still an open question. But I don't think we see it as much in, in earlier Northern Song claims. Um, Yao Xuan, in the section of a preface that I didn't read, actually makes that claim as well. And what I think this raises for us is the question of access that Song scholars and readers had to texts. And so we know, because we know about the, the laws passed in the late 11th century about uh, uh, keeping people from stealing things from the Imperial Library, right? Um, uh, because things were disappearing. Um, so we know, in fact, that Song scholars had surprisingly liberal access to, certainly compared to the Tang, to the Imperial archives, given their, depending on their position. Um, and they would make copies and they, they would take texts. So when we get into the 11th century, we're actually talking about a new universe of access to things. Now, that entirely depends on a particular position and service at the capital. And that becomes much more um, haphazard and contingent when you're talking about being sent out uh, on a series of, of different official posts, right? And there, what you often do is you turn to the locale and, and see what you can collect um, there. Um, and then you write to friends and ask them to send copies of things. And, and so we see, we see that in letters. Um, I have found uh, an old edition or uh, you know 10 new poems by Meng Jiao in this place and I'm copying them out here to send to you. So I think thoroughness becomes a, a cultural value in claims about compilation and edition, not just about the tongue, um, certainly by the late 11th century. And now we need to think also Let's think about Sima Guang, Fan Zuyu. Think about the late Northern Song historians who would also make similar claims about thoroughness, that they have comprehensively gone through every available source for, a, you know, for compiling the Tangji of, of the Zizhu Tongjian, for example. I think it really does become an important cultural value. I think it comes from sheer physical material handling of texts, and it matures over time in the 11th century. 
Um, I don't think we see it quite as much in the early northern soil. So my thoughts about that. Well, only because nobody else is asking a question right now. I don't know if this is a little bit too far out, but you were talking about the idea of renegotiating, sort of recreating identities in a sense. You said with, with Levi, it was received, he, you know, his identity was received and yet still somewhat renegotiated, it sounds like, and re, repositioned. What do you think, can you make any comment about how Levi has been received and negotiated in Japanese popular culture? I mean, just because you know Levi, not because I'm asking you as a Japanese specialist, but you know, although maybe somebody else would like to comment about that. I, I would say Paula might like to comment about that. <laughs> No, and, and that's not, that is actually not an area that I have pursued uh, very much. Robert, do you, but, no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're, we're, we're throwing that, we're throwing that ball around. I mean, I mean, he's absolutely, I mean, he's, you know, I mean, he's iconic. Um, um, you know, the terrific thing, as I kind of alluded to briefly as I went through, is that um, the Levi corpus has many, many Levi's in it. And of course, the corpus itself, um, which, so we have a kind of chicken and egg problem here, which a lot of scholars have acknowledged, is that, you know, the kinds of poems that get included in the corpus, probably a little too liberally by Yue Shi in his desire for comprehensiveness, um, uh, you know, there, there are probably poems in that corpus that are, um, uh, how to put it, generic enough to sound like Levi that got pulled into the corpus that weren't necessarily Levi compositions. So um, Levi is just such a fascinating example because, um, because the personality and the reputation uh, is also played out in the corpus itself. And he, leads, he, he lends himself to kind of endless reinvention. So I've, I've published an article called Avatars of Levi. And so I think Levi eventually ends up being something, and this is true in the um, in the painting, excuse me, in the painting and material culture tradition as well. Um, Catherine Liscom has, has written about this. So Levi is endlessly reproducible and endlessly re inhabit endlessly re inhabitable. Um, so those are my thoughts. But can't say more about Japanese popular culture. So there was um, a moment in the Ouyang Shu. Uh, piece about Han Yu that was just so beautiful and so called mm -hmm. out for closer reading. And I mm -hmm. wondered if you had anything more to say about what he says about um, Du Chang Li Xian Sheng Wei Jiu Wu, yeah. Wei the Jiu Wu, yeah. and yeah. you know, the personhood and the object. Yeah. And then, um, you know, he says that he especially loves it because it is a Jiu Wu. It's a or, Jiu Wu. Yeah, so, you know, I just wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, actually what I find interesting uh, in, well, there are many things. It's just a beautiful, beautiful colophon, and it's famous because it is so beautiful, and it, and it's, it captures this relationship, um, this intense uh, relationship that Northern Song readers had with, with Tang text. Um, it's jiu wu, not a gu wu. So that, that actually, I think, is very important, as is the talking about the, the manipulation and the pasting in, the kind of loving care that, and that finally this thing has exceeded its limits because he's sought so much to, to compile and, and collate. Um, so there's a, there's a, an, an intimacy about this colophon that is, that I think is quite unusual. And so it's too, it's, it's antique, but it's also old and familiar and familial because it was a thing found in the family's house. And that, it's the intimacy, um, almost more than the intellectual biography, which was a section I, switched, I skipped, um, that, I find, um, that I find most gripping. It's and so immediacy. charming. I mean, you think of um, you know, Li Qingzhao and Zhao Mingcheng, yes. right? Yeah. And there's something about the act of supplementation and taking care of the old tattered manuscript. And, yep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very fascinating talk. Uh, so um, I think about when we uh, usually when we talk about the uh, the criti uh, critics of the Tang Song Shi Ci, usually they use Shi Zhuang Zi Mei, like the poetry is classic and normative, but the poet the Ci is kind of flashy or uh, frivolous. Um, I'm wondering, you know, for the receiving of the previous dynasty, the po the literature, mm. uh, you know. Maybe both the genre and the personality 
has you know has some uh, uh, relationship there. You know, for example, like uh, even Han Yu, you know, write about you know very Confucius you know uh, works, but also have writing poetry about very strange things like his shaking teas. You know, and uh, you know like Su Dongpo also write about uh, you know Jia Zai Niu Nan, mm. uh, you know Xi Fu Xi something like, and also Mei Yao Chen. So mm. I'm wondering when they. Maybe the fact of both the personality mm -hmm. uh, and the genre mm -hmm. could affect the the, the later uh, generation the receiving of the previous one. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. No, that's a terrific question. I really didn't talk about uh, about um, the boundary drawing, the kind of mapping of genres that I think happens very vigorously in the in the first decades of the early Northern Song. And so, you know, we have this problem, which is uh, as Steve Owen famously, what is what is Wen Yin Hua? I mean, that that's a question that we still have, are still haunted with. What is Wen Yin Hua? What does it represent? But one of the things, I mean, it, it is as Robert suggested, it is as much a lei shu as it is a a, a wen xuan. Um, but but it is divided by genres. But one of the things that it does is that it maps out new genres and topoi within genres that we don't see at least in extant uh, anthologies from the Tang, we don't see conceptualized before. So there is some very important drawing of boundaries around genres and subgenres. Um, so within prose, ji, for example, expands, expands, expands in really interesting ways. Um, uh, Yuefu shifts. Si emerges, but is absent from the significant anthologies, right? It's marginalized and silenced in the, in the major anthologies. So this is very much happening. And, and I would argue that, um, that personalities and the, the kind of personal histories and biographies of Tang writers mm, didn't, didn't necessarily map in seamless or clearly articulable ways with conceptions of the boundaries of genres. But Northern Song writers were very interested in drawing clear boundaries. And, and so the, the, the Gu Wen movement of the 1057 moment um, is itself a claim to establishing uh, a, new, a new kind of generic boundary. And, and of course, it doesn't, in fact, eliminate parallel prose, <laughs> far from it, in the Northern Song. But as a cultural claim, as a, as a moment, it's incredibly important. And there are others like it, so. That's a great question. Hi, um, this may be coming a little out of left field because I'm used to thinking about later things, but um, there's an evolution, you know, from northern to you know the, the Wen and Dao problem, and whether you mm. have any kind of uh, reflections on whether that, you know, by the southern side with the least here, you have kind of a breaking out of. Of, of Wen Xue, a kind of critique of Wen Xue as such, mm -hmm. as sort of missing the true legacy of the ancients, which is something different. And um, but it, is is that part of the same arc that you're tracing here, or is this coming out of someplace else completely? So. Uh, th thank you very much for the question. And and this is a question that I that I have been thinking, I've I've taken very very seriously since the beginning of the project. And you know, one of the one of the arguments that I really want to make in the book that, in fact, this this renegotiation of the cultural past takes place out ahead of and influences the ideas of Daoxia that mm. emerge in the late Northern Song. Mm. So, so the um, adoption of Han Yu uh, and and the the Gu Wen authors as models and idols to be venerated and, and their particular approach to the way. Um, runs out ahead of ideas about writing, the, the failure of writing to carry the way. And in fact, of course, as we know, the Daoxia turns around and critiques Han Yu's position, Zhu Xi, critiques Han Yu's position, said that he should not be considered as someone who actually carried the way. Um, but that's really a later moment. So, so in fact, the, the stabilization and the, and the compilation, this, this desire to stabilize Tang literature really runs out ahead of that. Now, what the relationship of that is to, say, the Chang brothers' conceptualization of Wen, I am not entirely sure. I haven't quite entirely decided that. that that's a question that, that, that haunts me. But I will say, I think, from a very simple perspective, that the critique of, certainly by the 1060s, we see a much more 
um, serious critique of both Tang political history and Tang literary history. There is a sense that um, there's a more aggressive uh, reinterpretation of events of the Tang. And so I would point both to Zizhu Tongjian, but Fan Zuyu's Tang Jian as well. Um, a, a, a new desire to maybe attack the, the emerging canonicity of certain Tang writers. Um, so that would provide them more distance on the Tang. And, and again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the Chung brothers <laughs> since that, that's, that's beyond me. But I guess my, my major concern is actually to, to lay out this relationship before uh, that, that it really does run ahead mm -hmm. of what happens um, in the development of Daoxue. I think that's really important. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not an expert in Chinese history. I'm only a sophomore, actually. Um, but I great. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Um, so this question may seem relatively simplistic, but I was just wondering. I guess it speaks to the significance of literary history in general. Um, what was the extent of the impact of Tong? Uh, literary history in the song, um, but and by that I mean, was it really just literati sitting around and being like, "Wow, that Han Yu was really something," or was it like, <laughs> <laughs> um, or was it? You mentioned the printing press and how these anthologies were were printed and widespread. How widespread is there any evidence of like the average merchant maybe <sighs> reading Tong poetry? Or yeah. I mean, I know the song valued education, but um, yeah. but I, I'm just yeah, I'm just curious really. It's a fantastic question, and it's a really important question. I would kill for more evidence of circulation, <laughs> kill for it. So for just to take, and, and I really have to think about one example at a time. So Wen Sui is actually an example that during the Northern Song, um, we do have repeated references, including in uh, the records of B Buddhist monastics, for example, talking about the Wen Sui and having copies of the Wen Sui, people mention it in letters. And then in the Southern Song, we, it goes into reprintings and people also talk about it, um, uh, particularly uh, around the time that Wen Yinghua was, was printed. Um, but not enough. We don't have enough for, for Northern Song, and, and we have very few Northern Song editions. Uh, it's really it, not until the Southern Song that we get to, we get more text to actually, in manuscript, uh, excuse me, printed editions to look at. Um, so there's just not enough evidence. Um, you know, and what, what we have, though, is certainly discussions, imitations of Tang literature, uh, imitations of Tang poetry. And so what we can see is not just colophons, prefaces, random comments, um, visiting sites where Levi visited and writing a poem about it. We see that kind of engagement as evidence. Um, we also see references to this kind of thing, referring to Han Yu, or the, the, um, my final piece of evidence there, the, the, uh, the Huang Tingjian colophon. So he is literally writing out a copy I just love this piece of calligraphy. This is in the Princeton Art Museum. And I have to say that I, um, I, I take my students to see it in the, in the vault, as it's called. Um, and it is one of the most exciting experiences in, a, in my semester when I teach the intro to Chinese literature is having them, their jaws drop when they're standing next to this. Um, so this, this was, in fact, he says he's, he's copying out a piece of Gulen to send to his nephew. So we have this kind of evidence, but not enough, really, um, a, a, as much as I wish we did, about uh, numbers of copies or sales or anything like that. That's really late imperial. So, Thank you so some, some of my conclusions are speculative. <laughs> Just one quick question. Um, so I am really curious about the practice of imitation of particular mm. poets. And I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about the role that that played in the establishment of what the Tang was. Because often these imitations are pretty terrible. I mean, I'm just speaking about Oh Li my Bai. God, Guo Xiangzhen. He's like, he's the, the most tone deaf reader of Levi so ever. Horrible. <laughs> it's, it's, these, these are caricatures. Yes, often. they are. It's very they rare, are. especially in the case of Levi, imitations yeah. of Levi, because he seems yeah. so eminently imitable, but in fact, he's Bukashia, right? So, 
So it's a very interesting thing. So I was just wondering, like, how does that fit? Are you going to write about this in the book? Is there going to be a chapter on this? Uh, there's not going to be a chapter on that, but I am going to, I've got, uh, I think, probably two articles to do about, to, that I want to do about this. Um, to me, the most fascinating, and this goes back to what Robert said, that I absolutely agree with, the most fascinating uh, relationship is the Ouyang Xiu Mei Ao Chen relationship, which maps onto uh, Han Yu and Meng Jiao. Um, and it's it's on the one hand almost a kind of cosplay, um, um, in that, that, that they're so attempting to so fully inhabit inhabit these roles, which of course puts Mei Altan in the Meng Jiao role, which which is there are downsides to that, right? There's just problems with that. Um, uh, but also, you know, imitating their poetic voices. So this the imitation, I, I argue in the in the mid 11th century, this is what I want to do. Um, Really takes a brand new, a brand new turn in the 11th century, the 11th century poetic practice. Um, and as you said, there's this wide range of incredibly tin ear, awful caricature-like imitations, and you can you can feel it. You're, you know, it's like um, sort of like you know nails on a blackboard or something. When somebody gets it wrong, right? Badly by is terrible, um, uh, and bad dufu is pretty clunky too. Um, but but the development of that imitation poetics is itself, a, I think, a, a fascinating problem. Right. It, it, it speaks to the idea that we're recognizing a voice, that, that there is a voice right. that they're, needs to they, be. They're constructing and reaffirming the voice right. as, as a moment in, in literary history. Yeah. Hi, um, I was really drawn to what you said about, uh, I think it was Wen Tingyun, and I'm not sure, um, about how conflicting um, depictions of authors in Tang anthologies lead to a new knowledge or a new, like new knowledge creation. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say more about that or maybe clarify, because I think when we look at Chinese literary history, there's mm -hmm. so many like gaps and so many conflicting like sources so how do we like kind of make sense or piece together um these authors from um with like so such conflicting information oh i think my first answer would be we have to live with the messiness we we have to live with the conflicts and the tensions and so um you know what i'm showing is the kind of de desire to rationalize and clarify um but what i'm trying to do in the book is expose is to shed light on these moments of intense messiness and contention um, because you know I mentioned a kind of feedback loop that these that these texts and Robert talked about this as well um, that these texts influence and help shape later views but there are also uh, contentious relationships between texts um, and you know one could argue that that the Xin Tang Shu revision of Jiu Tang Shu is in fact in competition and contention with the very literariness of the Jiu Tang Shu's vision of Tang culture, which I of course want to think is closer to the Tang reality, but I would I wouldn't say that. So um, so I think I think that that more granularity, more messiness um, is is richer, is much more interesting. Um, a, as a way to think about these these writers as they're evolving, as long as we understand that, you know, there is a desire to stabilize, there is a desire to create a coherent literary historical narrative, and for didactic purposes, I mean, you know, that's that's a very long-standing desire in the in the Chinese literary tradition, and, and for important reasons. Um, but I, I want to push back against that simply to show the more exciting kind of chaos um, out of which these portraits emerge. Thank you for this wonderful talk. My question is maybe just dialing the clock back a little bit. So I wonder if you can provide a little bit more about your assessment of the role that the five dynasties play in terms of influencing or mm. kind of dictating the Northern Sun take on um, Tang literary culture, especially considering that, as you have said in earlier in your presentation, that they were part of the dissemination and trans transformation of the entire legacy of the Tang, but also that because many of the literary figures in the northern, early Northern Song were, I think, yeah. like products of the education and culture mm -hmm. of the five dynasties, and not yeah. five dynasties, but also the kingdoms themselves. So I wonder if you can provide a bit more on that. 
I would be happy to. There's also a historian in the room who's working on five dynasties history um, and culture. And so we could talk to Professor Tackett about this as well. Um, but, I, but I would say, I mean, I mean, historians are still not just literary historians, but I mean, historians of political and social history are still trying to build out a picture of the understudied period of 907 to 960 or in the 980s. And you're absolutely right. And I think it's incredibly important, including to compilations of Tang literature, to look at the roots of some of the early Northern Song courtiers, such as Xu Xuan, Xu Xuan being very, very important, um, but others who come from, so Xu Xuan comes from the, 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 um, the Nantang, um, his former Nantang official, um, the influence that their erudition and reading and knowledge had on the shaping of, of early Northern Song compilations. Um, I mean, the picture is less clear for Shu, so which I've written written about Shu itself, right? But um, because there is less a direct line as there are for the Southern Tang officials to the Northern Song court, fewer of officials from from the latter Shu um, go on to immediately influence the Northern Song court. That being said, Sichuan did we notice that Sichuan came up like four or five times in my talk? Um, becomes this. Uh, I think, unique repository for Tang literature. Not everything gets shipped off. And for a particular culture of erudition and learning in, in, uh, in, in Tang literature. Um, that story is still to be told. I mean, I, I think there's just a lot more work to be done on Five Dynasties and, and the Southern Kingdom's influence on, on what happens here. So. Thank you all for coming.